morning. How are you this morning? Good. I'm glad to hear that. It's good to see you. I welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, you can see the announcements listed in the worship folder, some calendar, calendar items uh, listed. The deacons are going to meet at 11 o'clock. Uh, today we'll get together up in the library uh, area, so you're welcome if you're a deacon, you're welcome to come and be a part of that as well. Uh, looking ahead, Friday, October the 4th at 5.30, the uh, His Kids uh, program for community children. October the 6th at 6 o'clock is uh, Love Feast. October 6th is going to be World Communion Sunday. Uh, and so Love Feast is coming up for that. October the 8th uh, on uh, Tuesday, uh, we'll be having a sorting day. That'll be here at 9 o'clock. Uh, Saturday, that's a busy week, the 4th, 6th, 8th, 12th. Uh, on the 12th is another district campfire. That'll be at 6 o'clock at Camp Emmaus. I, I know that some people, I know Tricia at least, I'm not sure who else, but I know there were other people who uh, uh, went to the uh, campfire yesterday at Camp Emmaus, the uh, celebration of the conclusion of a successful camping season. I'm glad you had an opportunity to do that. Looking ahead to October the 14th, the community dinner up at the Faith United Methodist Church. We're one of the churches responsible uh, for helping to provide a meal this time. Uh, and that'll be at five o'clock for all of, all of you who are interested in coming to that. Uh, you can come earlier than six o'clock, I should say, for that Camp Emmaus uh, campfire. You can have some hike, hiking, uh, have some hot dogs, things like that, whatever you would like. Also, the Lifeline Food Pantry, we are uh, continuing to collect uh, for them this month, and we are collecting uh, instant uh, potatoes for the food pantry this month. So you're invited to bring those in. If you want to leave them on the bench next to the door, we'll see that they get to the pantry. Uh, we're also collecting offerings uh, for Church World Service Blanket Ministry. Uh, there's a, a plate on the... Um, table that's just in the back of the, nar of the sanctuary there in the narthex for those of you who would like to make a contribution there. Uh, for announcement type things, I think that's all I've got. Does anyone else have any announcements at this time? Elmer. Our organizational plan says special church council meetings may be called by the moderator or the leadership team chairman with two weeks notice. As the leadership team chair, I would like to call a special church council meeting following worship service on October 6th, which is two weeks from today. The reason for the meeting will be to hopefully gain the congregation's approval to spend church funds on our restroom improvements here at the church. All right, so mark your calendars. That will be October the 6th, uh, and um, we will be discussing uh, disbursement of some funds. Thank you. October is our month for Vesper services over at the nursing home here in Polo. Um, I would really like to have a person or a group or somebody for each Sunday this year plan it, and um, Jeff can help out, I can help out, but it'd be really great to have somebody else be in charge of each one of those. Um, I've got my calendar right here, so the line can form at the end of the bench here, at the end of the service for everybody waiting to, it's our first come, first serve. Yeah, don't, I'm, I'm watching, is anyone? Okay, okay, okay. Oh, after church. Oh, of course. That's why. That's why no one's coming right away. Okay, I got it. I got it. I saw a couple people were like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Okay. Are there others? If not, then I invite you to join. Oh, I'm sorry. <sighs> Last time you played, I looked and you didn't say anything. Ah. <sighs> Uh, so the crop walk is this afternoon in Oregon, and I know Lynn and I are walking, and um, we've put our forms out in the back. And um, so uh, if anyone wants to donate to that, you can uh, put some um, a check to CWS Crop Church World Service. So CWS Crop, I believe is what the, it says on the form, and then uh, or to cash. So we're just saying we're walking for crop today. Thank you for doing that. We appreciate that for both of you. We appreciate the ministry of Church World Service uh, through things like the crop walk, the blankets that we're collecting for, and other things. We're glad for that. 
and glad for people who participate in those ministries, glad for people who benefit from those ministries. Uh, today is, by the way, the first day of fall. Officially, it's fall. So uh, I figured it was time to officially get out the uh, fall-looking uh, seen, although that maybe the, the leaves aren't quite there yet, but give us a couple weeks and we'll get there. I think the first day, I, I should have checked, I believe the first day of winter is December 21st. So you've got, you, you know, you've got a little bit of time yet till it's actually winter, and we'll see what winter is like this year. Winters have been strange the last couple of years. Anyone else? I invite you to then join me in our hymn number 37, uh, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. If you need the tune, as I say, it's number 37, and the words will be on the screens. You're welcome to stand if you wish. Thank you. You can be seated. I like sometimes we we lose sight of the images uh, or the imagery in hymns because of the the uh, in older hymns, particularly because of the older language. But I like the the image of Jesus with his love in that very last line. As with his love, he befriends thee. I, I, I like I like the way that sounds, and I like that image of of being Jesus' friends and being Jesus' family and being in community and friendship and family with one another. I just love that image. Uh, it is time to share out of our joys and our concerns. Uh, we're in prayer this week for the Romine Church of the Brethren, which is in Salem, Illinois, down in uh, South Central uh, Illinois. Uh, I didn't know much about Salem. I looked it up. I found that uh, if you're a history buff, William Jennings Bryan, uh, who was a senator and a, a presidential candidate two or three times, he was from Salem, Illinois. Uh, his brother, who was also a senator, was from Salem, Illinois. Uh, when I was in college, I was into some, sometimes some kind of unusual uh, music, and uh, one of the bands that I would listen to sometimes in college was called Captain Beefheart and his magic band, and uh, Rockat Morton, who was the bass player in that band, is from Salem, Illinois. So you never, it, people, it's just interesting where, what little communities produce different people. We're in prayer for the folks at Romine, uh, for their ministry, for their congregation, and for their leadership. 
We're also in prayer for the Church of the Brethren Office of Peace Building and Policy, used to be called the Washington Office, which described where it was, but didn't necessarily describe what it did. Uh, so they do work at peace building and, uh, and policy issues. They uh, do a lot of ecumenical work with other agencies. Uh, they support training for a lot of different people in a lot of different things. This is uh, Nate Hostler, who is the director of the office. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Jennifer, were missionaries in, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, uh, for uh, several years. Uh, their son Ayuba is, gosh, he's probably kindergarten or first grade by now, which is hard for Julia and I to think about because we were there when he was born. Uh, so we're in prayer for Nate, for all the different BVSers and all the different folks who are a, a part of the ministry of the Office of Peace Building and Policy. Uh, we also continue in prayer uh, for uh, Courtney Stauffer's mom, Cindy Thompson. Cindy's in uh, OSF St. Anthony Hospital uh, up in Rockford uh, and has been uh, for uh, the last week or so. Uh, she suffered third degree burns. Uh, those of you who know Cindy know that um, she's uh, frail physically uh, to begin with. Uh, and so the family uh, and Cindy are facing some decisions about what kind of treatment and how long treatment may continue and, and they're kind of working through that issue. So it's hard enough on its own, uh, let alone with, uh, with the added decision making that, that needs to happen. So we pray for Cindy uh, and we uh, pray for uh, Courtney and her sister Kelly and uh, her dad Jeff as they kind of work their way through the things that, that they need to decide uh, in terms of Cindy and her care. Uh, we continue in prayer for Bill and for Betty Hare, uh, for Eileen Kinney, uh, for Pam Lindsley. Uh, we're in prayer for Mandy Spengler. Mandy is a, a friend of some of us, uh, particularly Patty and I at the Polo Area Community Theater. Uh, she's one of our, uh, in the play that we're doing right now, she's one of the actors and also is, is a stagehand sometimes, but she was in the hospital in Rockford for a couple of days uh, at, uh, I believe she was at the Swedish hospital. Uh, with some abdominal issues. Uh, she's gonna have to go up to a university hospital in Wisconsin, I believe, for further testing a little bit later on. Uh, so we're in prayer for Mendy uh, as, she, uh, as she deals with those kinds of issues. Uh, we ask for prayer for Tammy Byrne, uh, who is a, a woman who I um, met, uh, uh, a woman Julia and I have helped out and the church has helped out indirectly, uh, introduced, us, introduced me uh, to Tammy. Uh, going through some depression and going through some, some difficulty with some different issues for her, health issues and emotional issues. So we're in prayer for Tammy. Uh, there are some different situations, obviously, of violence going on around the world, uh, uh, physical violence, shootings, uh, wars, conflicts, uh, emotional violence. Uh, there is a conflict politically, that just not just in our country, but in countries all over the world. We pray for peace and we pray for community and we pray for understanding in all of those different kind of situations. Something I meant to mention two, three weeks ago now, and I forgot to, uh, I got a knock at the door from someone who I, I did not know, asked if I was the pastor here, and I said yes. And she said her name was uh, Bernice Farnham, uh, and she had uh, attended here uh, long ago, once upon a time, uh, and um, wondered if she could just come and sit in the sanctuary for a little bit. Just kind of revisit memories, uh, revisit uh, God's spirit, which she knew in this, in this place, which led her into the mission field later on. Uh, and I said, of course, and, and she, she did that. Uh, and uh, I was gonna mention it that, that following Sunday and something came up and I forgot about it. And then I noticed uh, that while she was here, uh, she signed the uh, guest register out front. Uh, didn't leave an address or anything, so I can't help you with that. But I'm, I'm glad for Bernice and I'm glad for her ministry over the years. And I'm glad for all of the people, some of you who may be here who knew her, uh, when she was here before, or some of you who have memories of the people who were here before, you know, we're glad for people who were here before, who were formative in her youth here, uh, just as you are formative uh, for people like Emerson and people like Taysom and, and people like Cambry and, and Cam and Catherine and others, we're glad for those of you who are forming whoever the missionaries are, 
in the future, whoever the farmers are in the future, whoever the teachers are in the future, but especially and all encompassing that, whoever the followers of Christ are in the future. Thank you for all of you for your role in that, past, present, and future. Uh, do we have others who wish to share this morning? Yes, I see. Yeah. I see a, okay. oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I'm uh, happy that my brother Boyd is here this morning and from Indiana. Welcome. I, my joy this week was to see Pastor Jeff in the packed um, play. Yeah. He makes a wonderful grasshopper. You should go, if, you're, if possible, to see him. He's quite a handsome grasshopper. And uh, it's a very enjoyable little play. Thank you. I should say, by the way, it's good to see you again, Maddie. Glad you're here. And uh, the, the play is James and the Giant Peach, 2 o'clock this afternoon, 7 o'clock next Friday, 2 o'clock next Saturday. Patty is in it as well. She is uh, in the uh, ensemble, so she's doing a whole lot of different things. I have one thing I get to focus on, and she gets to do like half a dozen different things, which sometimes is easier, sometimes is harder. It just depends. And you got to come if you ever wanted to see me in a bright green three piece suit. That suit is cool. I love that suit. I'm going to see if, I'm, if they'll let me buy that. Go ahead. Brent and I are happy to have Irv and Joyce Toms here today. Um, we got to know them through our ice cream and other than Bill, they are probably some of our biggest groupies. So we're <laughs> thrilled to have them here and they uh, attend the Mount Morris Church of the Brethren. They're Welcome. in the back row. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Are there others? Yeah, I'm, I'm not the only one that misses you. I know. Now I have a joy. I do want to start getting out the word that on October 13 is a Sunday, right? I wrote it down. Okay, October yes. 13, uh, we are having the Polo High School Jazz Band here. They have performed um, over at... Uh, Pine Creek Christian, and I heard about it, and uh, I said, would you guys come play for us here? So that'll be some special music uh, supporting the Polo Schools here, music program on the 13th, if you can be here, October 13th, it should be great. I'm looking forward to that. I am very, very much looking forward to that. October 13th, Polo High School Jazz Band during Sunday worship. Are there others? Over, over here. Oh. Good morning. I just wanted to say it's nice to be back at Ann Gartner. Ann, I grew up as a Blau in the church, and Eric is here with me today, too. So nice to be here and, and see the rain making everything uh, a little more refreshed and a good harvest start to the season. Thank you. Welcome. We're glad you're with us. Uh, he's on his way. He's on his way. He's got to get his, I don't know if you've got your Fitbit on or not, but I'm ready. I should be walking this around. We had a turkey family walk across our backyard today. There was mother and father and four children. And it was fun to watch them walk across our yard and doing their thing. All right. And your, your cat didn't necessarily think it was fun. I'm not sure where the fun is the word he had for it, she had, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are there others? If not, then I invite you to join in hymn number 505, I am thine, O Lord.
Let's pray. God, draw us nearer to you. Draw us nearer in every way. Draw us nearer emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Even draw us nearer physically as you use our bodies and our, the gifts that you have given us to share your kingdom and spread your word. Draw us nearer to you, God, and, and as we draw nearer to you, help us to draw others nearer as well. Help us to be the people you want us to be. Help us to commune with you friend to friend. Help us to ask questions. Help us to listen for answers. Help us to know and help each person on our prayer list this morning to know what it is they're called to do, who it is they're called to be, what it is that you have for them, what unique way you have that they can minister, that they can share, that they can, can help others, that they can call others to accountability, whatever it may be, God. We pray for the congregation in Romine, the Church of the Brethren there, for Nate and the Office of Peace Building and Policy. We pray for Cindy Thompson, for her family, as they work through a number of different decisions. Pray for Bill and for Betty Hare, for Eileen Kinney, for Pam Lindsley, for Mandy Spengler, for Tammy Byrne, for Bernice Farnham. We pray for ongoing situations of conflict and violence, whatever that conflict or violence may be, and wherever it may be, globally and around the world or within our own families, our own workplaces, even within our own, our own interior lives, our own souls, our own minds. We pray your presence in those situations. We pray your guidance for all of those involved. We pray and are thankful for Bernice Farnham and others who have heard your call to ministry. We all are called to be ministers in one way or another. We all have gifts to share. We all have abilities that you want us to use. Help us to find those gifts. Help us to know and act out in those ministries. And we thank you, God, for the people who, who formed and shaped and helped Bernice and others over the years the people who have helped and shaped and formed us. And we pray, God, that we are worthy as you call us to help and form and shape younger generations of Christians, of, of people here in the congregation, of children, of adults who are in new relationships with you. We are thankful for and pray for everybody involved in those formation type situations. We're glad, God, to have friends and, and family visiting and sharing with us in worship, and we pray safe travel for them, and we pray that they are blessed by their time here. We're thankful and looking forward to opportunities for additional worship, love feast, or, or the, the, the jazz band uh, coming on the 13th, or, or the crop walk this afternoon, or all the different things that we shared in terms of announcements. There are so many opportunities that we have to gather and to share with one another, and we're grateful for all of those things. We're grateful for the beauty of nature, as we see in, in turkeys, in rainfall, in, in sunshine, in rainbows, in so many different different things some of them at the moment the rain you know the rain may not seem like a good thing if you're caught in it without an umbrella or something like that but they all have a role in your creation they all have a role in the cycle of life that is essential for all of us there are so many other things God for which we could pray and for which we can be joyful that we have not lifted up Look into our hearts. Deal with what it is that you find there. Hear our prayers and our praises and our thanksgiving, those that are spoken and those that are unspoken. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
as we think about offerings, I, I think we, we've touched on some offering kind of things already. When we think about the ways that the community supports one another, the way that communities form one another, the way that that uh, wisdom and and learning and teaching and faith are passed down from generation to generation, and in some situations, the way that that adults can learn about faith from from children, the way that 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 teaching is passed kind of back up the chain, so to speak. There are so many different ways in which we are called to minister, in which we are called to work, uh, and one of the ways in which we are called to share, of course, is through our financial gifts. The uh, ushers will wait upon you now uh, and receive your tithes and your offerings uh, as we sing number 544 uh, when we walk with the Lord. Let's pray. God, we do pray that we are acting in obedience to your call on our lives, and we trust that we are rightly discerning that call. Help us to know what you want us to do. Help us to know how you want us to serve. Help us as we dedicate our lives and these gifts to your glory and to our neighbor's good. For these things we'll be grateful as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we have two scripture readings this morning. Uh, the first is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Uh, they here is referring to Jesus and the disciples. Uh, they left that place and passed through Galilee. And Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask him about it. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. And sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first, must be the very last and the servant of all. And he took a little child whom he placed among them. 
And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Our second scripture is from James chapter three, uh, starting at verse 13. We'll go up to chapter four, verse three, and then skip ahead to verses seven and eight. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You, before I actually begin the sermon, you never know exactly what people are keeping track of. The, the sermon title in the worship folder is So in Peace, uh, which of course is on the front of the worship folder and is a, a piece of the reading from James. I ended up not using that as a sermon title. I never actually replaced it. But you never know what people are keeping track of. I was an interim pastor at the Salem Mennonite Church in uh, Kidron, Ohio. And one of the kids there uh, kept track of the uh, length of my prayers every every um every sunday and on the way out we're shaking hands and everything say it was like two minutes and 15 seconds it was three minutes 46 seconds thank you kevin i appreciate that that kid is now the pastor there so i i have been tempted to go back and time him on a couple of things but last week uh for those of you who weren't here last week i talked about a time when i had preached something in such a way that one of the people who heard it completely misunderstood me. And I said, and it's true, that that was on me as a preacher. In those kind of situations, whether it's preaching or teaching or something similar, public speaking kind of situations, it is pretty much the responsibility of the speaker to make sure that the message is clear. There are times, though, that the, that the listener has to assume some responsibility, too. And our reading from Mark is one of those times. Because this isn't the first time that Jesus has explained to the disciples what's going on. If you, ha- if you were following along in a pew Bible, I know most people don't because we have the scripture up here. But if you were following along in a, uh, in a pew Bible, uh, or if you look the scripture up when you get home, you'll see that the heading above it, Uh, The heading above our reading from Mark says, Jesus predicts his death a second time. And what is that prediction? That the Son of Man, that's Jesus, is going to be delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him, and after three days he will rise. Now this isn't anything new to the disciples. It's at, at least the second time. That in Mark that they've heard him say this. And I say at least because the Bible uh, doesn't pretend to record every single thing that Jesus said or every single thing the disciples heard or did or learned in their three years together. Mark especially does not aspire to that. Mark is like all action and boom, 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 moving from place to place. So it is very possible that Jesus has said this to them more than the two times that Mark has recorded thus far. 
And what does Mark say about the disciples? That they didn't understand what Jesus meant and they were afraid to ask him about it. Now this is at least the second time that they've heard about this. So that means that they didn't understand it the first time either. And since they didn't understand it the first time, it mean, and they don't understand it now, it means they didn't ask Jesus to explain before, back when they didn't understand the first time. And that's the whole point of what Jesus is doing. He sent the crowds away because he wanted to teach the disciples. He wanted some, I shouldn't say, small group time, not one-on-one, -on -one, but one-on-twelve time, you know, small group time to teach the disciples, maybe you know, answer questions if they had them. That's why Jesus was doing this, but they didn't ask. Now, I understand to a point, sometimes we are embarrassed to admit that we don't understand something that someone is saying. I'm that way sometimes. I mean, I, I don't like admitting that I don't understand. Uh, I'm sometimes embarrassed if I have to tell someone I don't remember their name, even. It doesn't have to be something big. It could be some, I shouldn't say that, people's names are important. It doesn't have to be some big abstract kind of idea. Sometimes I don't remember people's names and I'm embarrassed to tell them I don't remember their name. Have you ever been through that? You keep, you, you keep you know, saying things and hoping that they'll give you a hint as to, uh, as to who they are or someone else comes up and you'll introduce them. This is, this is my friend Lynn and, and not introduce them and hope they'll introduce themselves to Lynn. You know, you've, I mean, there's, we've all done that. The comedian Brian Regan says that uh, he talks about watching someone walk toward you at a party and you don't remember the name and all of a sudden your mind in the back, it's a, there's a wheel of fortune wheel, you know, and it's, a, it's six letters. You have a K and a T. Good luck. You know, that, the first time they don't ask, you know, I get it. I might not have asked either. The second time, it's a little harder to excuse. Jesus tells the disciples for a second time that he's going to be killed. For a second time, they don't understand. For a second time, they don't ask him to explain. Instead, they manufacture some drama among themselves and argue about who among them is the greatest. They hope, they hope that Jesus won't notice that they aren't asking any questions. And, or maybe Jesus will think they're, dis they're over here discussing this deep theological truth that he has just revealed to them. Uh, and and that he, won't, they won't real, he won't realize that, that they don't get it and what they're arguing about. And then they arrive at the home that they were headed to in Capernaum. And Jesus gives them another chance. To, to talk about their trip, asking them, what, what were you talking about on the road? And again, they're too embarrassed to answer. Jesus reveals he knows exactly what they were saying, exactly what they were doing, instead of trying to understand what he was teaching. Uh, Chelsea Harmon describes the scene. She says, picture the scene. Jesus and his disciples have arrived at someone's home have likely received a hospitable welcome by its inhabitants from servants washing their feet, providing them food to eat. At every turn, they've been welcomed. They've been treated well as though they are great and important. And then Jesus says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then... You know, some people are busy talking about who's the greatest. Other people are living being great. And we get to a, a famous moment in the Bible. It, uh, there's a couple times that this happens, actually. Uh, Luke has it, uh, and a couple, it's a couple places in different forms. Jesus calls a little child into the center of their circle, uh, takes the child in his arms and says, whoever welcomes, one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Obviously, there's a lot of symbolism in what Jesus says and does with the child here. First, we need to clarify exactly what it is that Jesus actually does. The NIV translation, which we're using here, says that Jesus takes the child in his arms. That might mean he 
picks the child up. That might mean he uh, uh, grabs him, the, him or her. It might mean he sets the child on his lap. Sometimes we see pictures of Jesus with a, a child on his lap or something. The word that Mark uses here is, is a word that in other contexts uh, is translated hugging. So Jesus isn't just picking up a child or holding a child or something, but, but hugging, embracing a child. Uh, second, as with a lot of things in the Bible, the cultural context for children then was a lot different uh, than it is today. Children were property, quite literally. Uh, there's a song in the play, the, the two evil ants in the play. The villains of the piece are two ants named Spiker and Sponge. And there's a song in the play where they're doing, where they're speaking of their nephew James, for whom who they have uh, legal custody of, and they say of their nephew, technically we own it. They could have sung that song here in the Bible because children were property, property of their father. They had no status, they had no particular value. They had uh, uh, no value, I should say, at least until they were old enough to work and earn some money. Children added nothing to any social situation. Yet here is Jesus sitting among a bunch of men who have just been arguing about which one of them is the most important, giving a hug to a child and saying that children, who are literally the least important of anyone in this particular scene, are to be welcomed. Third, small children aren't always that nice to hug or hold. You know, sometimes they're dirty. Sometimes their diapers smell. Sometimes they have food smeared all over their hands and their face. Maybe their nose is is runny and their mouth is kind of gross or maybe their hands are sticky or something you know yeah you those of you who've raised kids or are raising kids yeah that's that's how it goes sometimes now you've known since this picture came up on the screen that i was going to talk about jesus and the little children do those children in that picture look like they smell bad no probably not uh do they look like they're dirty uh, hard to tell if it's, there's some, some gray, but is it dirt or is it shading? You know, I, I, you couldn't, you, their, their faces look clean. You wouldn't look at those kids and say they look dirty or smelly or sticky or anything like that. Uh, I did a Google search for Jesus hugging children uh, to see what kind of uh, images I could find. Do you think I found any images of Jesus hugging a child who looked like his uh, diaper needed changed? or who looked like she just got done picking her nose or something? No, no, I did not. I found pictures uh, like this, more of a, a clip art kind of thing where Jesus is hugging a family and we have the, a dove there for the Holy Spirit. Uh, I found uh, several pictures, of course, where Jesus and the child were of a different race than our uh, stereotypically white Jesus. This is uh, the passage from, uh, uh, from Luke. Uh, I did a, a search specifically for Jesus hugging a dirty child, uh, and I, I did not find one. The only picture I found that was at all different uh, from others, aside from race, uh, was this one, uh, which I think is a, it's a pretty cool picture. Uh, and uh, according to the caption, it says this is Jesus hugging a child with a disability, and I think, it's probably a, I think that's probably a Down syndrome uh, child. I think it's a lovely, lovely picture. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't look at that and say this child is, is you know, gross or, or dirty or, or something like that. You know, think about what real children are in your own life. And then think about what real children would have been like 2,000 years ago when you had no access to washing machines. Uh, you didn't have ready access to tons of diapers. You didn't have running water uh, to easily clean up either yourself or the kid. Uh, think about that kid who wandered into the midst of Jesus and the disciples and what he or she might really have looked like at that moment. 
Just a little while ago, the disciples were trying to cover up their embarrassment at not understanding what Jesus was saying by arguing with each other about who was the most important. Now, in their very midst, Jesus hugs a little child and says, welcome, 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 repeatedly. This kind of ties into what James has to say about what it means to be truly wise. In verses 17 and 18 of chapter 3, James writes that the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, full of good fruit, impartial and sincere. Who does that describe more? The disciples or the child that Jesus hugged? Now, I don't want to make children sound perfect. They aren't perfect. Uh, they often are not submissive. Uh, they are not necessarily considerate uh, or particularly uh, uh, peace-loving. Uh, children, are there. they try, I think, to be pretty fair, impartial within the limits of their understanding, within the limits of their, the, you know, the limited moral code that they're developing when they're, they're little kids. I do think they do try to be impartial. Um, but, but they're not perfect. At the same time, children are a lot closer to that description that James offers than the disciples were, arguing about who was the most important. There was little pure or a little merciful in their discussion, particularly when you remember that they were doing that instead of asking Jesus what he meant and what he wanted them to learn. Doesn't the beginning of chapter 4 in James sound like the disciples? What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. That's about their understanding right there. They don't have it because they haven't asked for it. And when you ask, you do not receive because you have wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Whatever little kids do or do not have going for them, when they ask for things, they tend to be sincere. They tend to ask with a genuine desire to receive whatever it is they are asking for. Now, it might not be something good for them. It might not be something that they should have. They may not like it once they get it. You may not want them to have it. You may not want to give it to them. But the chances are good that whatever a little child is asking for, in their mind, they really, truly, sincerely want it, at least in that moment. The disciples did not have an understanding of what was going on because they did not ask Jesus to clarify what he'd said. Instead, they coveted a position of importance in their own hierarchy. Had they asked Jesus? And had they asked with what James calls right motives, with a genuine desire to learn, they would have gotten answers they could understand. What do you need to ask about? What do you struggle to understand? There are a lot of things for me. Some of them are related to faith and Christian living. Some of them are related to just everyday life. It's okay to ask if you genuinely want an answer. It's okay to not know something. It's okay to be like a little child, even a dirty, sticky little child. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be humble and humbly seek the wisdom that God can provide. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 341, Jesus Loves Me. I don't think any of you will need the tune for this because this is the to, 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 the Jesus Love Me you learned when you were a kid. Did you know that there are seven verses to this song? I did not. Uh, there are. Uh, there are six verses in some accounts, seven verses, depends what source you look at. We're actually going to sing three of them. Uh, so, but it's a tune you know. 
Uh, and some words that will be a little bit new to you maybe, but that's okay. You're welcome to stand if you wish and join me in Jesus Loves Me. now with God and go in peace. Amen.